Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the first chapter, verses 8 through 17. Romans 1, 8 through 17. Listen to the word of God. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you, so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, or rather so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Here in the readings, let us pray. God is, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Growing up in Ashland, Kentucky, I knew only two colors of people, black ones and white ones. There were a handful of Jews in town, known mostly for owning the clothing stores, but there was no formal synagogue and no Jewish young people my age. The only significant religious diversity existed between Protestants and Catholics. The Roman Catholics maintained their own school from 1st through 12th grade, so there was minimal interaction between Catholic students and Protestants except on the basketball court. When someone used the term mixed marriage, they meant a Protestant and Catholic crossing that invisible line. Yet, though the line between Protestants and Catholics was rather distinct, the one between church and state was rather blurry. Every year in school, there was a Christmas program headlined with Christmas carols about Jesus. In the sixth grade, my teacher made all of us learn the Lord's Prayer and 23rd Psalm, reciting the psalm in front of the class. When I was in high school, I got into the football games for free because I was willing to say the prayer before the game, the Christian prayer. Now, today... The street on which I live has people from Greece, Poland, the old Yugoslavia, and New York City, which is kind of like a foreign country. (laughs) My children went to school with young people from India, China, Germany, and France, among other places. Muslim students consider how to play sports while observing the fast during Ramadan. My Indian neighbors brightly decorate for the Hindu New Year. I, of course, still eat barbecue at least once a week, but my other weekly culinary choices are the Pita House run by Palestinians and the India Palace owned by a guy from the Punjab region of India. Even though South Carolina is one of the most conservative and least diverse states, over the last 25 years we have experienced a tidal wave of people who ethnically, culturally, and religiously are not like us. I, for one, 
would argue that this exposure is a good thing for us and our children. But it does bring to our attention, sometimes challenge some of us, that some of these, our closely held beliefs, could be challenged. And one of the places we see this impact is in religion. When I was growing up, everyone, except for a handful of Jews who we never asked their opinion, believed Jesus was the Son of God. We may have been perplexed when Catholics ate fish on Friday, put Jesus on the dashboard, and dressed their nuns and priests in goth clothing, but we still believe they believed in Jesus. Whereas today, the skin color of the person standing behind us in the Walmart checkout line may be another shade somewhere between white and black, and may put Mohammed or Buddha or Ganesh in front of Jesus. Now, people, of course, react differently to this diversity. Some attempt to hold back the tide. Others decide no faith question really matters that greatly. But a third way doesn't seek to denigrate what others believe, yet helps us be clear what we believe and why it is important. So this morning, I want to ask the question, does it matter what I believe about Jesus. The New Testament answers this question with an emphatic yes. The goal of the entire New Testament is to convince us that Jesus is the Son of God. So why does that matter for Christians? First, because we believe human beings are inherently sinful. The theological term most often used for this is original sin. It essentially declares that human beings are born with a propensity to follow our own needs and desires. Even the best of us, without divine guidance, will tend to choose what best suits us, usually convincing ourselves it is also what is best for everyone else. We do not believe people are basically good. The temptation to choose our way over God's is so powerful that only the Spirit of God working within us can enable us to choose for God instead of ourselves. Now, this doesn't mean that humanity is evil or that we never choose for the common good or that only Christians do good things. But in our heart of hearts, we desire to be the God of our lives. And only the Spirit of God can consistently move us in the direction of God. You probably have heard the old joke about the fellow who was told, cheer up, things could be worse. He said, so I did as I was told. I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. We believe that our human nature is such that without Jesus, things will get worse. Second, it matters what we believe about Jesus because what we believe drives how we act. If we believe Jesus is the Son of God, That means he understands humanity better than anyone who ever lived. And if he understands us better than anyone else, then his proclamations of how we should live tell us how we can be the most productive, fulfilled, and happy. If we don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, then his declarations on love, forgiveness, generosity, and mercy are only suggestions, opinions, instead of divine revelation. We can pick and choose what we think sounds good. This is why a biblically-based theology or belief system becomes so important. It provides a basis for how we view and react to the issues that confront us on a daily basis. As human beings, our powerful ability to rationalize can make almost any action logical and necessary. 
whether it is stealing, coveting, or lying, we can always come up with a good reason for why we did it. But if we believe in Jesus, our attitudes toward the poor, the disenfranchised, the sick, the outcast are driven by how Jesus related to them. If we proclaim Jesus is the Son of God, his words, his actions, his direction must come straight from God. Some of you may be familiar with the old fable about an elderly man who was traveling with a boy and a donkey. And as they walked through the village, the man was leading the donkey and the boy was walking behind Townspeople said the old man was a fool for not riding, so to please them, he climbed up on the animal's back. Well, when they came to the next village, the people said the old man was cruel to let the child walk while he enjoyed the ride. So to please them, he got off and set the boy on the animal's back and continued on his way. Well, in the third village, people accused the child of being lazy for making the old man walk. And the suggestion was made that they both ride. So the man climbed on and they set off again. In the fourth village, the people were indignant at the cruelty to the donkey because he was made to carry two people. So the frustrated man was last seen carrying the donkey down the road. It is from Jesus that we receive direction how to treat everything from animals to people. Without Jesus, we become led by the whims of others or our own needs and desires. Why does it matter what I believe about Jesus? First, because human beings are inherently sinful, we will tend to choose and act according to our needs and wants. Second, it matters because what we believe drives how we act. And third, what we believe about Jesus matters because there has never been anyone like Jesus no other great religious figure in history has displayed the love, the forgiveness, the wisdom, the divine attributes, the sacrifice of Jesus. When through the centuries we watch Jesus in action, when we observe his capacity and willingness to reach out to the unlovely, to forgive the unforgivable, to speak truth to power, we know we are witnessing what humanity would be at its very best. We can get so caught up asking if Jesus' miracles are true or did he really raise Lazarus from the dead. But the real miracles are when he decides to eat with the hated tax collector Zacchaeus. When he turns to the crowd, points to the woman of ill repute and declares, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And he says to the rich young ruler, give away all you have and come follow me. When he looks down from the cross and laments, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When we look at Jesus, we not only know he is God, but realize. He is who we are meant to be. On Christmas Eve, the church's small sanctuary was packed to standing room only. That year, this particular church had decided to have a living nativity in front of the church while the service was going on including the presence of a real live baby in the manger instead of the usual predictable and quiet baby doll. Well, as the pastor was preaching his sermon, the baby did what babies tend to do. He filled his diaper to overflowing. 
Well, pretty soon the disgusting smell began to waft through the crowded warm sanctuary, causing people to wrinkle and plug their noses, their eyes watering from the stench all right in the middle of the sermon. Now, there are certain distractions that preachers can handle during a sermon, like fussy children and a cell phone ring, but this one couldn't be overlooked. Without missing a beat, however, the pastor looked at his grossed out congregation and back at the now smiling baby and said now we have an idea of what Christmas the incarnation was really all about it's not clean it's not pretty it's not fragrant and there's no halo around the Holy Family there's an odor not an aura and God becoming a human was a messy, smelly business. Now, most of us want to dress Jesus up like a divine superhero. But Jesus lived like you and me. And his encounter with humanity was a messy, sometimes smelly business. Yet it was also Almighty God reaching down into the very heart of our lives. Does it matter what I believe about Jesus? So often this question becomes encumbered with whether or not we must believe in Jesus to get to heaven or comparing Christianity with other world religions. But the true importance of the question is how it impacts my life. If I believe Jesus is the Son of God and that he died to save me from my sin, then I realize that belief becomes the core element of my existence. The goal of my life is to be like Jesus. I work, spend my money, raise my children, treat people different from me, seek justice in the social, economic, and political realms, offer myself to God is driven by how Jesus reacted to these realities. This morning, do you believe in Jesus? Is that belief the primary motivation of your life? It does matter what we believe about Jesus. So today, as you and I examine our lives, what do you believe?